Hello, good morning. I'm Gerald Pasqual from Moss Adams, and I will be getting us started for this session, Economic Update and Real Estate Industry Q&A. Thank you for joining us. The presentation you are about to see is not legal, accounting, or investment advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional services provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, now that we have that out of the way, I will now turn the floor over to Kelvin Tetz, partner and national practice leader for real estate here at Moss Adams. Kelvin, the floor is yours. Good morning, welcome to our economic update and real estate q and I'm excited to have Ken join us today to give us an update and walk us through uh, his, his view on the current economy. A lot has changed since our last presentation, and with that, we'll go back to Gerald for our first polling question. Our first polling question on the screen reads, what industry do you represent? Real estate, hospitality, construction, professional services, or other? Please click directly on the slide next to the answer of your choice and hit the submit button. I'll give everyone here uh, a couple of seconds, about 30 seconds or so, to enter their answers. All right, very good. Let's take a look at the results. Looks like most of us here, 46% are from real estate. With that, I'll go ahead and turn things on over back to our speakers. Uh, good morning, uh, this is Ken Rosen speaking and delighted to have a chance to do this again with you. Uh, I know that uh, this is a huge volatile time and my summary slide really talks about this, that uh, we're talking about inflation. 
which is now the highest in 40 years at 8.6% CPI. Uh, we have labor shortages, supply chain issues, uh, surging energy prices, surging residential rents and house prices. And basically, we think we're going to be in a stagflation period where economic growth is going to slow down and we're still going to have inflation. Uh, and the real worry here is, do the inflation expectations become unanchored? And do we get a wage price spiral? And, and as a result of this worry, the Fed has become very aggressive. Uh, complete 180 degree shift from where they were. They're moving towards rapid monetary uh, policy tightening after having the loosest monetary policy in uh, my uh, in living lifetime. They increased 75 basis points the the federal funds rate on June 15th. They've done 150 basis points since March, and they've forecasted further increases. The next one coming in the middle of July. Uh, and they want to get rates to short rate to 3.4% by the end of December and 4% by the end of 2023. That's what their guidance is telling us. They're also reducing their balance sheet by $1.1 trillion per year, uh, starting actually just last week. Uh, so this, they're forcing a messy uh, correction in capital markets. We've been telling you for some time we expected that to happen, uh, but it's now actually happening. Uh, add on to that some uh, uh, unexpected events, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is, uh, uh, has some very negative impacts on the world economy, especially on inflation in Europe and elsewhere and food prices. And war, by definition, of course, is irrational. So we can't really tell you what's going to happen here. The latest attacks on uh, shopping centers by missiles. I mean, it's, these are out, it's out of control. And finally, of course, COVID will be been hanging over for two and a half years now. Uh, we're coexisting with COVID. We've reopened our economies. The vaccines and boosters and uh, the uh, lack of hospitalizations or the small number of hospitalizations make feel people feel comfortable, but there could be a new variant out there. And so we have to worry that, well, for the moment, things are better on, on that front, and that's really the major positive. Uh, we have to be careful that it doesn't change. So I'll turn it back to Gerald for one more polling question here. Thank you, Ken. Our second polling question is now up on the screen. It reads, what economic factors have most impacted your business in the last year? Inflation, migration trends, cost and access to capital, labor challenges, or other? Once again, please click on your response and hit the submit button. I'll give the audience a couple seconds here to enter their replies. All right, very good. Let's take a look at the results. The leading responses at approximately 34% each are inflation and labor challenges. I'll turn things back over to you, Ken. Well, that sets the stage for our next slide. Is this uh, recession and recovery that we've had is the most unusual ever in our post-war period. We shut down the economy two and a half years ago to stop the virus. And since we've reopened, we've almost fully recovered in terms of jobs that have been lost. Uh, and so, so it'll be the shortest recession we've had, but also the steepest one, uh, and it's created lots of, uh, of issues. Uh, if you take a look at the next slide, uh, the, the place that really has not fully recovered yet is really just one big sector, and that's leisure and hospitality. And of course, there's been a lot less international travel, a lot less business conventions, uh, and so that industry has not fully recovered yet, but it's moving towards recovery as the virus is tamed. So if we take that out, uh, we're basically at about the same unemployment rate we were uh, before COVID began. And the next slide just shows you the uh, employment growth. It's really been so unusual. It's been what I call a pencil recession. And if you look at that box on the lower right-hand side, you can see we've gained uh, four, five hundred, six thousand, hundred thousand jobs a month. It's slowing now because we're almost back to full employment. 
But this was a highly unusual time period, uh, very different than anything we've seen before. And the next slide just on unemployment shows you we're back to where we were before COVID. 3.6% is full employment. And in fact, the next slide on shows you we've got 11.5 million job openings. So we have a lot more job openings than unemployed people. Never has it been this strong a labor market. Uh, the chairman of the Fed has said strongest labor market in anyone's lifetime. And it's bifurcated, as the next slide shows you. Some places are doing great. They're actually booming. So uh, Dallas and Austin and Texas, uh, Florida cities like Tampa, uh, Miami, Orlando, absolute booming. In California, the Inland Empire and Sacramento booming. Uh, so it's really uh, uh, basically bifurcated. And at the bottom of the chart is places like San Francisco and New York, uh, uh, L.A., where we have not recovered all the jobs. We're getting close. Uh, in San Francisco, we're uh, almost 90, 88% recovered. Uh, New York is 90% recovered. And as conventions begin and travel begins again, we're going to see all that happening. So most places are fully recovered. And some are, are just absolute booming. The secondary cities, the next slide, really shows you that real boom has been in, in places that people are going to live and work. And this was happening before COVID. It accelerated. So Boise, Idaho, Jacksonville, Raleigh, Durham, Salt Lake City, Nashville, uh, Charlotte, San Antonio, uh, Las Vegas. These, a lot of people moved here during COVID, but they were growing before COVID very strongly. So that is really the bottom line story that the geographies are very different. Now it's a real estate market picking job. Uh, uh, you have to be in the right markets and the right product type. And I think this trend to, uh, on out migration shows up next in state out migration data. California had its slowest population growth, actually population decline the last two years. Net out migration from California mainly to our neighboring states in Texas. New York, the same thing has happened. Uh, again, there, much of the migration has been to neighboring states in Florida. But these high tax, high cost, high cost states, uh, like Illinois and Massachusetts, losing population to the next set of states, next slide, the in-migration to Florida, Texas, the Carolinas, uh, Tennessee, the neighboring states to California, Arizona, Idaho, Utah, Nevada. So this is a demographic trend that as real estate investors, we should look very carefully. You want to go where the people are going, and that's where they are moving to. Now, usually, as the next slide we'll talk about, we have a lot of international migration. We've been running 800,000 to a million legal international immigrants per year, and they've been refilling our cities in California and New York, uh, Chicago, but that stopped under the last administration. They, in fact, stopped it completely in the, the last part of the administration. And COVID, of course, hurt as well, as was hard to get here, all the restrictions. So we've had only 200,000 people move here legally the last uh, year. And that's part of the reason we have a labor shortage. We're missing those 2 million immigrants that we would have had over the last three years. We didn't have them. So that is, again, part of the labor shortage issue, especially in in industries like construction and hospitality, agriculture. So next, turning to the consumer price index or inflation. That's the big news. Uh, and it's news that has not been there before since the late 70s. Inflation rates that we have seen, 8.6 on the CPI, 10.8 on the producer price index, and the PCE, which is the personal consumption expenditure index, 6.3 far exceed the Federal Reserve's target of 2%. The 2% number, which we've had uh, for a long time, and maybe 2 to 4%, we've been very much in a very low inflation world the last 40 years, I think is over for good. We're not going back to 2% unless the Fed is willing to create a hard landing recession. The biggest component that we all think about, the next slide, is the goods inflation, which has been very, uh, basically zero the last uh, a decade and a half, we've imported inexpensive goods from Asia, mainly China. Uh, with COVID, uh, supply chain disruptions, energy prices going crazy, uh, we had prices go up dramatically. We were at one point at almost a 20% annual rate. 
prices are coming down. Lumber prices have come down. Uh, a number of material prices have come down. But we're still running about 11% rate of inflation, which is much higher than we've seen historically. But the worry most is the next slide is uh, on services. Service inflation, which includes housing, uh, has uh, accelerated to 5.7%. Services are 70% of the economy, and that's why the Fed's so worried. This is way out of range of anything we've seen recently. Slide, the next slide talks about the fact that we have explosive residential rent inflation. So the first three lines of this chart, CPI, rental component, shelter component, and PC shelter, show that the Federal Reserve data that they see from BLS and others show only a 5% growth in rents year over year, or the cost of shelter year over year. But we know that is so untrue. The actual data show uh, house prices up roughly 15% a year for the last couple of, two years in a row. Uh, multifamily rent growth, 14% running uh, at this rate. Construction cost up 18%. So this is massive inflation in the residential real estate section, uh, sector. Remember, this accounts for about a third of the CPI, yet the CPI doesn't show it yet because of the way they collect the data. Uh, and this, so there's a lagged impact. This is all going to show up in the data over the next year to 18 months when the surveys catch up with the reality in the marketplace. So what that means is that even if we see goods inflation come down as supply chains open up, the rent inflation that's already happened will start showing up in the indices. So it's going to be very hard for the Fed to manage this. And it shows up in wages. The next slide, hourly wages up 6.1%. Again, these are two percentage points higher than we've seen in some time. So the Fed is going to have to uh, rethink their 2% goal. It doesn't get there unless we create a really tough time. Many of you know construction costs have gone up. Uh, again, our data shows 16 to 18%, but many people say it's bigger. Uh, and this has never happened before. This is all out of bounds, anything we've ever seen. So it raises the cost of replacing uh, real estate, which will help existing assets. Uh, we think this is going to slow down as material prices come down, but the labor shortage, uh, of course, is the big, big issue for everyone in this industry. House price appreciation, the next slide. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, we're both over 15%. Even during the great house price bubble of the late uh, uh, last uh, uh, decade, 2004, 5, and 6, we didn't see these numbers. We did in California, but not every place else. So this is outsized, uh, and the sharp rise in mortgage rates, we've had them go from 3% to almost 6%, is going to slow down the house price appreciation, uh, we think, to a 5% level this year. It's still running higher than that according to the data, but I think it's going to slow down dramatically by year end. And there will be a number of markets where house prices will actually decline, the hottest markets in particular. Uh, energy prices also have surged. Oil uh, continues to, to be over $100 a barrel, goes up in gasoline prices every week. And as a result of rent going up dramatically, food prices and energy prices, the next slide shows you consumer sentiment is at the lowest level uh, in modern times, even lower than the Great Recession, period of uh, 2008, 9, and 10. So the consumer feels sour, um, and, uh, and it affects, of course, all the polls on politicians as well. So people feel the economy uh, is near or in a recession, on the wrong track. But the economy is still booming. So it's a very interesting uh, discrepancy. In the end, the consumer spend 70% of the money. If they stop spending, uh, that will cause a problem. And the real bottom line uh, and the most important thing to watch is inflation. We think inflation is going to remain elevated for much longer than the Fed thinks. The Fed is still saying inflation goes back to 2% in 2024 and 2025. They have this miraculous period where we don't create a recession, uh, but uh, inflation comes back down again. But I think there are a number of reasons to think that's not the case. The extreme monetary stimulus, they are pulling back. But if they move back to a, a 3 to 4% short rate, uh, well, that's higher than we were before COVID. That's still very low. And the 10-year bond, 
you know, today at the a three and a quarter percent is just where it was before COVID. So they're going to have to move rates up a lot more to create this uh, uh, period of time uh, where they uh, get inflation down. The balance sheet going from nine, 98.8 trillion back to six trillion is due still two trillion more than before COVID. So money is not really going to be tight in the same sense as it uh, was in previous periods. We're still running a trillion dollar deficit a year. Uh, in a full employment economy, uh, and that makes no sense. So, uh, yes, the deficits over the last five, uh, four years were seven trillion combined, and that all has to be financed. The house prices, as I mentioned, and rent increases are going to show up with a lag in the data, but they'll be there. And the most important thing to say is globalization, which has been to our benefit in reducing uh, our cost using global labor force that's cheaper. Uh, that's gone, or at least a lot less uh, 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 evident. China, we've been in a, uh, basically a tariff war with China, and it's not importing, we're not importing deflation any longer. Uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine means we're going to have a very bifurcated world with trade barriers and tariffs and sanctions. Demographically, we're aging, our population's aging, which means we have a lot less workers per retiree. So that, again, is going to put upward pressure on wages, uh, labor shortages in, here in Western Europe and China and Japan, and, Japan, uh, and also decarbonization. Uh, we want to do that for environmental reasons, but if we do that, that's expensive. Uh, so all these things, are, I think, are mean inflation is going to remain elevated. We don't think it's going to be 8 to 10 percent, but we do think 4 to 5 percent. There are some counter trends out there with a weakening economy. Uh, lumber prices are down, fertilizer prices are down, shipping costs are down, uh, ship prices are down. So it may well be that the slowing economy will pull back some of the inflationary trends. That's why we have inflation coming back from the eight to nine percent range back to the four to five percent range, but not back to two. So our basic economic outlook, the next slide, is that we're going to have a period of stagflation the next uh, three years. What does that mean? That means growth rate below potential. It's going to be growing, uh, you know, one to two percent, maybe a half percent. We'll get some negative quarters, as we already did. Um, we don't think it'll be an actual recession, but very slow growth, very slow job growth, 100,000 a month uh, or less, uh, and inflation's elevated. Inflation's elevated uh, to the four to five percent level. And as a result, interest rates remain elevated. The 10-year bond rate goes over 4%, uh, and the short-term rate remains in the 3 to 4% range. So that's our base forecast. But you can see it's at 50% likely because there's some big risks out there. The next slide talks about the risk. The risk really uh, is the financial market turmoil. The plunge in equity values uh, leads to cutbacks. Uh, we've already seen that in the tech sector. We're seeing cutbacks in hiring and investments. Um, the huge drop in the stock market, we're down in a bear market country here. It drops another 10 or 20 percent. Consumer spending, especially on big ticket items, could slow down. It's already showing up, uh, but it could show up more. Uh, again, the situation in Europe with Russia and Ukraine, I don't think is stable at this point. Uh, and we don't know what Putin is going to do. He's threatened Lithuania. He's threatening all these things. He, the barrage of missiles yesterday all over Ukraine mean he is not a stable person, and we don't know what's going to happen there. On the virus, it's good news so far, but new variants uh, are the big worry. Uh, and I do think that inflation in the 4 to 5 percent range is above what the Fed wants. Will the Fed stop raising rates? Uh, at the end of next year, or will they cause a hard landing because they still want inflation at two? I think they're going to give up on their 2% target and change it to four, but they may not, and that's, I think, a big risk. Also, we've added $7 trillion to the national debt. How do we finance that with these higher rates? And I mentioned a number of things about deglobalization. I think there's other things that could happen. China and Taiwan is certainly not a stable situation. We're having a worldwide food shortage now that because of Ukraine and Russia, they provide 35% of all the exported 
uh, wheat and some other uh, grains to the world. They, they are not doing that at the moment. Uh, we could have cyber attacks by Russia if they decide to get more aggressive. So we have a downside scenario, the economic outlook, the hard landing downside scenario, and that produces a, a very substantial recession, somewhat like 2008 to 2010. Unemployment rate goes back up uh, from the 3.6 to a, a 8 to 10 percent level. Interest rates uh, remain higher for longer because inflation is higher for longer. The Fed doesn't stop at four, but moves rates to six. The Treasury bond doesn't stop at four, moves to six. Um, mortgage rates get in the sevens. Uh, and that it does create a hard landing uh, where we lose um, basically about seven million jobs. Uh, and we don't think this is most likely. But at times, like today, the stock market thinks it's possible. The stock market has been very volatile and is worried about this hard landing scenario. So moving next to interest rates, uh, I think the key thing is uh, the move up in rates. We've had a 40-year decline in the 10-year bond. It moved from 8 to 9%, uh, and it moved all the way down to 0.52 at the bottom of the COVID recession. It's back today at 3.25%. Uh, I think the long bull market bonds is over, and we're going to see interest rates move up further. And, of course, the short rate the Fed controls they suppressed it for a decade during the great, after the Great Recession. They let things normalize in 2018, and we thought we were going to go back to a more normal 3% level. They're back at 175 today, and they've now told us they plan to go to 35 to 4 And the next slide just shows you their expectation of rates. And remember, what this chart is, is uh, each quarter, each Federal Reserve Board member and each head of a regional Fed gives us their forecast on, on rates. And this is the forecast for year-end rates. And you can see they moved this dramatically. A year ago, no increase in rates forecasted. Now, all of a sudden, they're up, up at 3.4 is the median. That's the green. Uh, and then almost 4% next year. But they have it going back to 25 in the long run. So they're still thinking they're going to get inflation back to 2 and rates come back down again. Uh, and I think the market just doesn't believe it. And the next slide just shows you the balance sheet uh, went crazy. Uh, during the Great Recession recovery period, we increased uh, uh, the balance sheet, trying to stuff the system with money and get things moving again. QE1, QE2, QE3 went from a trillion dollars to four and a half trillion. Then they started moving the balance sheet down. Uh, and uh, we got back to 3.7 trillion. And then, of course, COVID struck. Uh, and we've moved the balance sheet now almost to $9 trillion. The system was flooded with money. Money was free. And we had all the speculative bubble stuff, cryptocurrency, all the things that we all saw, the fangs, cryptocurrency, meme stocks. It was uh, just wrong. We knew it was wrong. We told you that a year ago it was wrong. It was going to be a problem. Well, now uh, they know it's a problem, and they're trying to move the balance sheet back down again. Real interest rates, which are a measure of how tight money is, have moved back up from minus 1% uh, to roughly 57 basis points today. But in the long run, uh, they basically should be 1% to 2%. So normalizing monetary policy is going to require them to move rates up further, uh, quite a bit further than they think. Uh, we're in the process of that. It's a transition period. And the next slide just shows you it is central banks doing this. And one of the consequences of this surge in money supply, of course, has been uh, inflation. Now, one way inflation shows up, the next slide, is the U.S. dollar has strengthened dramatically against the euro and the pound and the, uh, the Japanese yen. If one ever wanted to travel to Europe and feels comfortable, uh, 105, 106, the euro is almost as cheap as it's ever been. And the pound at 123, again, very, very cheap. So it's a lot less expensive to go there, uh, and it does make uh, uh, basically uh, our exports uh, obviously uh, more expensive, but it also makes their, the exports from Europe less expensive. So what do we think is going to happen? Well, the 10-year bond forecast, we've given you um, three charts here on the next slide. Uh, you can see that the blue line is, is the forward curve. It's what the market is telling us that they expect. 
Uh, and the market expects rates to basically flatten out from these levels and not get much higher, 3.929%. But remember, in January, they said 2%. So the market doesn't know much. Uh, the green line is our forecast of getting the 4.3% on the base case. But if the Fed needs to do this and we need to have the hard landing, we could see this uh, rate go back to 6%, which, of course, would be a dramatic change from where we are. But even the doubling of rates, we are 1.5% at year end, as you can see from the, the table. And uh, we've, almost, we've more than doubled rates just in the last uh, six months. What does it mean for real estate? Well, real estate pricing uh, is uh, determined by the cap rate, and the cap rate uh, was at record lows uh, as we ended 2021. And uh, we see cap rates in the threes uh, for the highest quality apartments and industrial space, and in the five and sixes for retail space. Uh, however, we expect as the 10-year moves up, as it already has, that the cap rates are going to move up uh, and about half as much as the 10-year moves up. So we would expect cap rates in the mid-fours uh, uh, very quickly, uh, and then uh, a, a slower increase going forward. And then for office and retail, cap rates go up again, uh, again about 100 basis points. But the good news is, the next slide is, we started this with cap rates pretty high relative to treasuries. So unlike the late 80s, and early 90s where we had a real estate pricing crash, or 2007, 8, and 9 where we had, again, uh, a very sharp decline in prices, we don't think that happens this time uh, because cap rates, there was a pretty big spread. So the spread narrows. But remember, debt costs have gone up dramatically. And uh, debt costs uh, are up 170 to 200 basis points, and that as spreads have widened as well as absolute rates going up, and that means the leverage return has gone down, so you have to have prices decline. They may have declined 5 to 15% already, even though there's very few transactions to show that, but they may have declined that much already. So now I'm going to turn briefly to each real estate sector, give you a little view of where things are going, and I'll give you my favorite sector first, which is renters. Uh, the proportion of renters actually in the country peaked at 37%. Uh, and that 37% was uh, uh, in 2015. It then dropped dramatically, uh, and we're now at about 345 to 35% renters. The next slide just shows you that a lot of people moved back home with their parents during the uh, Great Recession. So we went uh, almost to a third of young people living with their parents, and COVID increased that. Uh, we do think that's going to decline. It has declined some. As much as people love their young uh, adults living with them, they really want them to be on their own. And, of course, if the kids have a job and good pay, they definitely want to be on their own. The next slide just shows you the population uh, turning age 18, which is when people usually begin to set up their own households. Begin, of course, there's a long period of time where that takes time. And we have 4.2 million people each year for the next decade turning age 18. So this is pretty strong demographics. But the next slide just shows you that the millennials are aging. Millennials are now getting to the 35 to 44 year old age group. And so that green line shows you they're growing rapidly. The very youngest age group growing more slowly, that's the Gen Xers. Um, still growing 1.2%, but growing more slowly. And the fastest group, of course, is the uh, retirees and the pre-retirees. Uh, totally expected that would happen. Also, uh, this generation of millennials has done things very differently. They've delayed marriage and, uh, and childbirth uh, and purchases. So you can see from this slide, big increase in age at first marriage, uh, almost running uh, to 30 years old. What has happened during this recovery period is there's been a surge in household formations. Uh, people have unbundled. The number of people per unit has, uh, uh, in an apartment uh, complex has gone down as people need more space because they're working at home as well as uh, living at home. Uh, we've also uh, seen, and so we think we've had a record level of household formation. It's a forecast. We don't have the actual data yet, but that's our forecast 
a record level of household formations. Uh, and you can see from the next slide, we also think that divorces have surged. Being in the same house 24-7 uh, for two years uh, has led to people realizing maybe they want a different uh, uh, spouse. So with that, we're going to turn back to uh, the polling question. Thank you, Ken. Polling question number three reads, what property type are you most interested in? Residential, commercial office, retail, hotels, accommodations, or other? A couple of reminders here as everyone puts in their answers. Uh, please remember to not only select your answer here on the slide, but also submit, click the submit button to make sure your response is recorded. And additionally, if you are looking for the CPE credit for this session, that you'll need to have answered three of the four questions at least. Very good, I'll give everyone a couple more seconds. And uh, I now see we have a quorum of uh, replies. Let's take a look at the results. By far, at 58%, uh, residential is the most popular response. With that, I'll go ahead and turn things back over to you, Ken. Yes, so perfect, some more residential stuff. So the next slide just shows you we are building the highest level of multifamily rental in the country that we have in uh, decades. In the early 80s, we did the same thing. We built a lot more, but we're building almost a half million starts in rental housing. And the reason for that, the next slide just shows you, vacancy rates are at record lows. We're at 2.8% uh, uh, vacancy rate for institutional quality apartments, lowest in all of history. And workforce housing, we're also at the lowest in 50 years. And we've had a skyrocketing, uh, almost a ski slope, as the next slide shows, of rental inflation. Uh, rents have uh, gone up uh, uh, basically in the mid-teens, almost everywhere in the country in the last uh, 18 months. That's an annual rate we've never seen in our history before. And I, we do it by market. We do very detailed studies of each market. And the next slide just shows you one of our studies. On the far right-hand side, you can see that rent growth uh, in the top markets is 15% or above. Places like Orlando and, T and Tampa, Miami, 20% or above. Uh, Salt Lake City, 18%. Uh, and the lagging behind is San Francisco, but year over year, we're up 10%. We're still below the previous peak. Uh, uh, and But Washington, D.C., again, up 10%, but still below the previous peak. Same thing with the East Bay. But this big recovery uh, in multifamily, especially in the Sun Belt and Mountain States, has been enormous. And the returns, slide next slide just shows you, have been the best ever in history. Last year, uh, the average multifamily uh, return was 24%, which includes change in value uh, and change in cash flow combined. So that is the, the highest return we've seen. But over the long run, multifamily has had the best risk return trade-off of any product type. So it isn't surprising. Next, turning to senior housing, got hurt very badly during the uh, COVID-led recession. Uh, occupancy fell. Uh, absorption was negative. Uh, we know the tragedies that happened at a lot of the senior housing uh, complexes. Well, that's all changed now. With the vaccine, uh, occupancy is picked back up. Rents are growing again. Uh, there's a lot of construction. Uh, and we do think demographically it's a very strong place to be. There's also the next slide talks about single family rental. rental. Single family rental has become institutionalized. Lots of big players in the market today, uh, and the vacancy rate is near a record low. And rent growth for single-family rental uh, has been, again, very much uh, a ski slope, just like multifamily rental. Uh, so strong demand for both single-family sales and single-family rentals. Next, office, uh, we have a problem. Office uh, availability rates, which include sublet space, uh, and uh, actual uh, direct space that's available for lease is at the highest level we've ever seen, almost 20%. And this does not even include the problem of getting people back in the office. 
The next slide shows you uh, the uh, blue line is what employers want you in three days a week or more. Uh, but the green line shows you 20% of the people don't want to come in at all. So this is a big, big issue. Uh, our view, and I think I agree with Elon Musk on this one. I don't agree with him much, but on this one I do. If you want to pretend to work and not come to the office, go pretend to work someplace else. It is not going to be easy to get people back in the office. And to show you how difficult it is, the next slide just shows you as of the middle of June, only a third of the people in San Francisco and Silicon Valley are in their offices. In Texas, it's closer to 50 to 60 percent. In New York, it's 40 percent. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, back in the office, test by these cards that go in. But uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, more people in. But on Monday, not. Friday, not. So this is a real big shift. It's because the labor markets are so tight and people got used to the life balance, the life work balance of working at home. Will that change? I think if we get a, a big hard recession, it will. Uh, but this hybrid model is probably here to stay. On the retail side, people uh, talk about retail as not doing well, but that's not true. Certain types of retail, community centers, neighborhood centers, power centers, are doing very well. Um, street retail in the right markets is doing very well. Uh, the big regional centers probably are uh, the lagging behind. But retail, people want to shop in person. Yes, they use Amazon other things, but they do want to shop in person and want to be there in person, especially uh, experiential retail uh, doing very well. Finally, uh, a couple of other sectors, hotels. Hotels, uh, again, have a bifurcation. Uh, hotels in big CBDs, central business districts, that are for conventions and global travel have not recovered fully. Occupancy is still uh, way off. Uh, REVPAR, which includes the, the average daily rate times the occupancy, is still negative. Resorts are doing great. People want to travel with a big pent-up demand. So there's no question that that's happening. Uh, and we also have, I think, a lot of strength in the low-end market, the drive-to market. So I think this is the big recovery area of hotels. No question that that's true. Uh, the final sector I want to mention is industrial real estate or warehouses. It's been the hottest sector of real estate. We have a 3.3% vacancy rate, again, lowest in all of history. Uh, red hot markets, vacancy rates in some markets like the uh, uh, Inland Empire, 0.6%. So there's been double digit rent growth and returns uh, last year were over 40% for those who owned warehouses. So again, each product type is separate, each geography is separate, time to be uh, uh, basically a real estate market and product type picker rather than investing in overall real estate. So finally, I want to summarize with uh, what I call the paradigm shift. Uh, the old paradigm of low inflation or deflation and suppressed interest rates, it's over. Uh, I don't think inflation is going to remain as high as it is now. It's going to pull back, but it's going to be uh, in the 4 to 5% range, not the 2% range. The massive monetary and fiscal stimulus, we overdid it by a lot. People in Washington should be ashamed of themselves for lots of reasons, but this one in particular. And so we're going to see still uh, monetary policy trying to normalize. It's going to be uh, quite some time to get back to normal. And I guess the de fiscal deficit with defense spending increases is still going to be big. So at some point, there's going to be, obviously, we know the inflation, but it's going to be, have to be some sort of adjustment in spending programs and taxes. Globalization, while it's not over, is uh, no longer a source of deflation uh, that we have. Uh, and we're going to have to have more self-sufficiency and resilience on energy and food and medical supplies. And we have a bifurcated world uh, with authoritarian regimes like China and Russia, uh, Iran, uh, and, uh, of course, Western Europe and ourselves. So it's quite an interesting time where we're competing all over the world for dominance. Uh, the baby boomer generation is nearing retirement, uh, but Gen X and millennial generation is, is taking over everything but politics. They've got to take over politics as well. The tech boom 
was fueled by easy money, the easiest in history. So the SPACs, the meme stocks, cryptocurrencies, FANG. It was a bubble. We all knew it was a bubble. I've been telling you this every time I've spoken to you. And that's burst at the moment. Stocks are down dramatically. Uh, and But there's still a lot of innovation economies that are going to do well, whether it be automation, robotics, cloud computing, 5G. There's a lot yet positive, and, of course, the same thing in the biotech area. I think the era of geopolitical and economic uh, stability that we had the last uh, five or six years is over. We've got war, pandemic, famine, economic and financial market volatility. That's the new reality. Uh, the star cities, which people invested lots in, uh, are going to struggle uh, because of crime, homelessness, uh, and the ability to work remotely. So the Sunbelt cities and the mountain states are, and remote areas are going to do much better. Uh, the offset to that could be increase in migration. We've had legal immigration being so important the last decade, and it's slowed dramatically now. Maybe they'll reverse that. That's the one positive that they can do it for the next generation. So finally, what would I do in this environment? Well, even though costs are up dramatically for financing, I still think it's worth hedging going forward. Because rates may not stop at the level the Fed's talking about, may get bigger. The cost of hedging is up 10 times, though, from when we've been urging you to do that previously. Uh, I would harvest gains. I know it's easy to say that we should have done it three months ago, but I think there's still further price deterioration likely in the value of real estate. Use 1031, uprate transactions. Uh, I know that Moss Adams has a great ability to help you uh, defer taxes. Uh, I, if I want to buy things, I want to things with short-term leases, with embedded rent growth, or ways to raise rent during an inflationary environment. And I think development in the right geography for logistics, multifamily, single-family rental, life sciences, student housing, grocery-anchored retail makes sense. But it has to pencil out, and we have to project the possibility of recession in doing your pro formas. So now we'll turn it back for uh, the final polling question. Thank you, Ken. And yes, we now have our final polling question number four up on screen here. What potential risks do you think may impact your business the most? Policy and regulation changes, interest rates, inflation, or labor challenges? Again, please select your answer here, and then uh, to input it to make sure your response is recorded, hit the submit button afterwards. And one last reminder, to qualify for the CPE credit for this session, you'll need to have answered at least three of the four questions we had during our session today. I'll give everyone a couple more seconds to input their answers. All right, very good. Let's take a look at the results. All right, by far, uh, at nearly 42%, the most popular answer has been interest rates, and then followed by inflation. So with that, I would like to turn things back over to Kelvin and Ken as we look at questions for this session. And Ken, thanks for the presentation. We have a number of questions here, so please submit uh, any additional questions you we, you have. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can, and um, you know, sorry if we don't get to all of them. You know, Ken, one of the things that I find interesting is the the topic of migration. You know, legal immigration has is at historic lows. What's kind of surprised me is not seeing any policy changes to allow that to open. Maybe it's pandemic driven. So maybe one question is, you know, do you see it? Are you hearing of anything that could change that in the near term? And then on the domestic migration, is maybe the question really is, are you aware of any data that's out there to project um, what could be happening with domestic migration? Will we continue to see, you know, this mass amount of 
uh, migration out of states like California and New York, or do we think that's going to maybe slow down a little bit um, as we, I think, yeah. what do you see, where do you see this going? Well, first on the international front, there's 1.1 million people visas pending. These, uh, they're just not able to get it processed. Uh, Washington is in, uh, again, because of remote work, it slowed everything down from passport approvals to visa approvals. This needs to be a priority. They want to fight inflation. The number one way to fight inflation is let these people in who clearly are qualified to get here. Uh, so, uh, And then in terms of reform, we need a bipartisan coalition, as we had with Ronald Reagan's uh, immigration reform. George Bush had a great plan, bipartisan, and it didn't happen, uh, almost happened. But we need to legalize uh, all those DACA students who have been here forever. We need to have a path for legalization for those who have been here for a long period of time and paid their taxes, have jobs. And we need, a, uh, uh, obviously, a, a, pro a program for visiting workers. We need to get this reformed, uh, and we also need to have secure our borders, no question. We can't get it done with the gridlock we have in Washington. So it is the biggest single thing we can do to change our course of our economy, uh, get our adequate labor force, handle all the retirees, uh, and we need to get it done. On domestic immigration uh, or migration, I think that there is some reverse trend in the sense that uh, some of the people who left cities are coming back. Uh, you see it in occupancy in apartments in New York and San Francisco. But companies are continuing to look for low-cost, no-tax venues, and individuals the same way. So the out-migration will slow, but not reverse. Uh, I think that this was going on before COVID. Uh, Texas and Florida, uh, the Carolinas and Mountain States, offer quality of life that our, many of our cities no longer offer. Uh, if we could get safety back in our cities and perception of safety, I think that would be a big positive. In California, uh, we raise taxes dramatically on the top portion of the population. Uh, we have a huge budget surplus. Not under consideration is moving those taxes back to where they were before all this happened. So we, ha we have a problem with our political system. Uh, that is, uh, I think, going to lead to continue out migration from our coastal metropolitan areas to uh, lower cost, lower housing cost, and lower tax environments. Quality of life, though, uh, is important, whether it be uh, commute time uh, and uh, homelessness and uh, clearly crime. And I, I'm very worried that our some of our CBDs uh, in uh, some of these progressive cities have gone the wrong direction, whether it be uh, a Portland or San Francisco. Uh, but some places are turning it around, and uh, that's the only thing. That, that's what we need. Thank you. Uh, you know, with the rising interest rates, and you're still seeing, you know, some acquisitions happening at today's cap rates, you know, even below the 10-year treasury. What's your thoughts as far as revenue growth and can it sustain the numbers that we've seen to justify some of the purchase prices? Because, you know, you, you mentioned that there's already some price adjustments happening. So we're still seeing some very large transactions where the price adjustments don't seem to be happening. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. So negative leverage, which is what happens when cap rates are below borrowing costs, makes me very nervous. Now, it is true that if you have rapid NOI growth expected or embedded in the portfolio, you can maybe handle that for a year or two. But I'm very nervous about that. And talking to the people selling stuff today, the brokers, they tell me prices have adjusted a downward 5 to 15% all in the last six weeks uh, because of the big increase in debt costs. So I, I do think the adjustments we're in a transition period. There will be there's transactions happening, but there's retrading happening. So I, I do think that negative leverage. I think it's very difficult unless you have a, a strong view that you're going to be able to raise uh, operating income substantially to get you back to positive leverage. 
So it's a, a tricky period, a transition period. Uh, we're telling our clients that they ought to adopt a, a turtle strategy. Get back in your shell and wait, because you'll be able to pay less for something a year and now, or six months from now on properties than you can today. Uh, so I, I'd say that's the tell, the, what we're telling our people to do. And transaction volumes, uh, I think, are going to slip uh, because of that. Transactions that might have happened three months ago won't happen. But there will people who, uh, I think it's going to be some capitulation on price. It's already happening from what I've been told. Could you expand a little on the impact of the Fed reducing its balance sheet? Yeah, so that's a great experiment. The Fed never has done this experiment until the Great Recession, where they take the balance sheet from a trillion, and today we're at 8.8 .8 trillion. So that flooded the system with money, and especially suppressed the long-term bond rate. So as they withdraw it, uh, there's still going to be plenty of reserves in the system. But the question is, how much does the withdrawal uh, and lowering of the balance sheet and, and letting the bonds run off that they hold and the bills run off, how much extra does that raise rates over and above their raising short rates directly? Uh, we don't know, and they don't know, and they admit it's an experiment. So that uh, worries me. Uh, and it's why I think the bias is that rates can go up more than people think. We don't know the answer, though, uh, to that question, and they don't know the answer. We've all seen the increase in the single-family rental market. I'm curious, you know, I've heard some numbers as to how many homes are being gobbled up by the large and institutional investors. Do you... What's your thoughts on the long-term impact of the growing single-family rental market and the size that it's gotten to today? I think it's, it's a great positive innovation. As, as, you, as you know, there have been a lot of single-family rentals already, uh, mom and pop. The institutionalization of it, I think, uh, uh, helps provide services for people who want the single-family lifestyle and location and services to go with it without having to take on a mortgage. Uh, and many can't qualify for a mortgage. So I think it's a great innovation. And especially I like the, the build single family uh, for rental, where they're building horizontal multifamily essentially with home builders. And that creates, a, I think, a, 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 again, a nicer environment than just buying a house here and there everywhere. But some markets, the percentage, the percentage overall is about 1% of the stock, so it's very small. But in some markets, it's 10 to 15%, 20%. Uh, and might crowd out some homeowners. I don't think it, it's a huge issue, uh, but it, it feels like it could be in certain markets. Uh, so I think it's a good thing to have an alternative to the high-rise multifamily uh, for people who want to rent and manage in a very professional manner. Uh, mom and pops do their best, but the professional management uh, of some of these companies is really, I think, a very big positive in terms of providing maintenance uh, and, uh, and the like. And kind of related to that, on the single family for sale side, still feels like there's a lot of demand, although tempered because of the rise in mortgage rates. Um, could you give some thoughts as far as where you know yeah. the for sale market is going? Yeah, so we're, we're transitioning from a, a super uh, seller's market to a market that's going to be more balanced. Uh, the inventory of unsold homes is rising. The days on the market is rising, especially in those markets that were so red hot. Uh, so the inventory is rising, and I think that's going to continue. Demand is pulled back because mortgage rates have essentially doubled, and people are shifting to adjustable rate mortgages, other things. So I think demand is off about 20%, uh, but it's still strong by the millennials. Uh, but the affordability has uh, re decreased dramatically uh, because of the rise in mortgage rates and the 30% price increase that's happened cumulatively the last couple of years. So I expect it to continue to soften and maybe get back to a more balanced situation. Uh, it already happened. Uh, prices are being cut. Uh, we're not having anywhere near as many multiple offers. Each market is different, of course, but uh, we're moving towards a more balanced situation. 
Well, with that, I think we are out of time. Ken, thank you very much for your thoughts and your time. Um, to those of you that we didn't get to your questions, we apologize and hope you all have a good day. Thanks for having me again, Moss Adams. We appreciate it. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you, Ken. And thanks to you, everyone in the audience, for attending today's session, Economic Update and Real Estate Industry Q&A. Before you depart, we would appreciate your feedback on this webcast using the survey we have launched in your browser. You can also visit us, of course, at any time at mossadams.com. We hope to see you at a future event soon. Please have a nice day. Thank you.